Hello, this is Tyler Crone with The Thundering 36. We are so delighted this afternoon to be interviewing the former U.S. Attorney for Western Washington, Nicholas Brown, who is running to be our Attorney General. Over to you, Nick, and welcome to The 36. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for having me back to talk and explain more about myself and why I decided to run for Attorney General. Uh, as I said earlier, I am losing my voice a little bit, so if you have any trouble hearing me, please let me know. Um, I'm running for Attorney General to continue the work that I've been doing for my entire career as a lawyer, to lift people up using the law, to keep people safe, uh, and to make this a better place to live for everyone in Washington. I grew up here in Pierce County. Uh, the, I, both my parents were military veterans and public servants, and all throughout my lives pushed me to give a damn about what was happening in my community and all around me. And really, as since I, being a young kid, I've always been trying to find ways to stay engaged and stay involved. And it's really led me here to be now campaigning and to asking people to hire me as their lawyer. Um, I left here to go to Morehouse College on an Army ROTC scholarship to pay for undergrad and then to law school at Harvard and started my legal career as an Army JAG lawyer. And all throughout my career, I've been really fortunate to have a really wide variety of different types of legal experiences. In the Army, I did family law and consumer protection. I did criminal defense work, defending soldiers, and then I became a prosecutor, served all over the world, including a year in Baghdad, Iraq, during the height of the Iraqi war. When I came back here, I joined the Department of Justice and worked on complex civil fraud cases and then criminal matters, principally around violent crime, trying to keep people safe from gun crime, from drugs, and defend their civil rights and liberties. And then I went down to Olympia and served as Governor Inslee's general counsel and just immediately realized that the things that I most cared about in my life were mostly being decided at a state and local level and not in Washington, D.C., and really just inspired me about what Washington State could do. And so I got a chance to work on a myriad of really important and challenging legal issues all throughout Washington State, work really closely with A.G. Ferguson on his team on a myriad of issues. And the last six months of my time with Governor Inslee were the first six months of the Trump administration, where I got to help Bob and his team defend uh, Washington State and lead our work against the Trump Muslim ban. And it was a really sense of pride for me to see what Washington State could do. I came back to Seattle and worked at a small law firm that does mostly public sector litigation for government entities and nonprofits, including my favorite client, the Alliance for Gun Responsibility, where we write and defend gun laws and defend those in court. And then in 2021, was nominated by the president to be the United States attorney, to lead the office where I once was, and to try to do everything we can to keep people safe in Washington state. So I know what it's like to lead a big, large public law firm, to execute with people and to execute on that vision. And I'm excited to be running now to continue that work. Thank you. Our first question is from Shep. Uh, what accomplishment are you most proud of in your legal career? Well, I've done a lot in my legal career, um, and there's a lot of things that, that jump to mind to me. So I'm going to just highlight a few very quickly. Um, when I was an assistant United States attorney, I did a lot of work working with our tribal communities uh, who have a lot of unique uh, issues on their communities. And uh, there was one case in particular where I prosecuted um, a tribal member for sexually assaulting three of his young cousins. And it was one of the most difficult tri uh, trials I'd ever had in part because one of the victims uh, had a very tough time communicating. And all throughout our prep for trial, um, she had a real tough time talking to me. And when I called her to the witness stand, I was not sure she would actually say a word, frankly. Um, and we put her on the stand and she told her story and she got through it. And in many ways, I felt like a proud father um, because her voice was heard. And, um, and you know, what was important for me was the fact that she told her story um, and she got through it. And that I think was part of the path for her to heal. When I left the governor's office, or excuse me, the AG's US attorney's office and I joined the governor's office, literally on my first day in office, I started working on his moratorium on the death penalty. And I think we changed the course of justice. And I led that work for the governor for the first year of my term time with him at a time when the legislature was didn't act. We couldn't bring, uh, bring together the political consensus to change that law, and we did it. Um, and I give the Governor Inslee a lot of credit for that, but it was my staff work that did it. The last thing I'll say was that when I was in private practice, I was hired by A.G. Ferguson and his team to help implement the Keep Washington Working Act, which was a law that was passed by the legislature around immigration enforcement. And that law required the AG's office to develop model policies 
in a number of really important policy areas, law enforcement, court systems, schools, et cetera. And they hired me to, to do that work. And so I spent a year traveling across the state, meeting with impacted communities to develop the model policies that are still the AG's policies. And that to see that work come into fruition, I was just really proud of. So each of those issues stand out for me as really things that I'm proud of. Thank you. The next question is from Barbara. Thank you. Um, Nick, what is your position on antitrust issues and how would you address those antitrust issues as AG? For example, we have the healthcare mergers, we have the tech industry power changes, we have Albertsons and Kroger, you know, absorbing Kroger. Um, can you talk about your position uh, on those on antitrust issues? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's one of the most important responsibilities of the AG to be a watchdog in this space. And, and we have a good legacy over many AGs of leaning really aggressively into uh, consumer protection cases and antitrust cases, used most typically using the, the consumer protection tools to go after these sorts of issues. And we have a lot of big challenges in the areas that you've highlighted. Um, and you, I think we all deserve an attorney general who's going to be really aggressive to go after the tech industry when they're abusing the public's trust. Um, and this ebbs and flows over time. Uh, obviously, Seattle and Washington is, is a home for so many tech industries, and it's an important industry here. Um, but when that power consolidates, there are problems that occur. Um, and antitrust has been a tool around now for many, many years um, and has been an important tool for us to use to make sure that people, people's individual rights are being protected uh, and their rights as a consumer are being protected. In the healthcare space, you know, the, obviously the legislature uh, made a big attempt this year to be a, a more aggressive watchdog on healthcare mergers. But this is really important for so many different reasons. Uh, one, to have access to healthcare for everybody across the state, particularly the smaller and rural communities that are most impacted by mergers. It has a big impact on people's jobs. Uh, and so when healthcare facilities close, we tend to lose hardworking healthcare employers. Uh, and both my parents come from that sector. So I'm particularly attuned to it. Uh, and we use we lose the opportunity potentially to have important uh types of healthcare available, abortion access, particularly when consolidation is being led by religious affiliated entities. Um, and I think we need to use some of the inherent, inherent authority of the AG's office to investigate and be a watchdog. Uh, even though the law around uh, keep your care did not pass this year, there's nothing that prevents the attorney general now from asking questions. When we learn about potential closures, when we learn about services potentially being uh, changed, I think the AG should be very aggressive in that space now. I don't think we need to wait for legislative approval to, and, and to ask questions of these facilities. And it's really, really important. And, you know, again, this is a legacy over many generations of attorney generals who have been really strong watchdogs in this space. Thank you. The next question is from Jeremy. Um, how do you view the current direction of the AG office? And what are some areas you anticipate that you anticipate changing course or new policies? Yeah, well, I have a tremendous amount of respect for A.G. Ferguson uh, and his team. And I, I want to give the team a lot of credit because I think he's really built a fabulous team uh, across many different agencies. Uh, and when I was working for Governor Inslee, one of my main responsibilities was being the principal liaison with Bob and his team. And so I have, I think, some unique insight working with them. I've also served as a special assistant attorney general in a number of cases um, in private practice. So my law firm is often retained to help support some of the state work. So I feel like I bring some firsthand perspective to that. Um, and I think they've done a great job. They are aggressive. They are building things that did not exist before. Um, you know, Bob built a civil rights division that did not exist before, which is frankly sad that it didn't exist uh, 12 years ago. He built an environmental enforcement division that did not exist before and has really done some aggressive and proactive work. Uh, and then obviously the national legislation, I think, has really laid a footprint and a model for many of us going forward. I think there's always room for improvement, uh, always room for improvement. And I've seen areas where I think they should improve. Obviously, they've had some troubles around transparency in some of their cases, and they've been hit for that. I think we need to continue to feel or find ways where we can improve the transparency of that office. I think that's part of being a professional. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of it, spending a lot of my career with the Department of Justice, is how professionalism is always the name of the game in working for DOJ. And so there's some things that I've learned in my career that would help implement there. Um, so there's always room to improve that work. 
And then the last thing I'll say is when I was the counsel and worked with them, oftentimes I would find a lot of really good litigators who would handle the case in front of them uh, and do it excellently, but not enough proactive thinking about what's the long-term impact of the types of cases that they're seeing. Rather than just dealing with that individual case, lawyers are uniquely positioned to see through lines and to help their agencies mitigate harm. Because at the end of the day, the AG's office is the people's lawyer. We're serving the public and we need to do a better job of helping the agencies problem solve. Uh, and so I think there's always room to improve that. It's something that I saw firsthand when I worked uh, with them. And I think that's an area for growth, absolutely. Thank you so much. Our last prepared question will be asked by Laura Marie. Hi. Uh, when considering the equity lens, what are some ways that the Attorney General's office can champion the smaller issues that are significant for individuals, but not necessarily grabbing big headlines? Uh, well, I would just say, like, if you're running for this job or frankly, any other job to make headlines, you're not in the right field. Um, I've been drawn to public service all my career um, because it's the right work and it is something that is always personally called to me. And it is something that I find the most rewarding because it's hard and challenging and it makes people's lives better. Uh, and you know, frankly, the vast majority of the work that the AG's office does is not in the headlines. Um, there are 800 lawyers processing number of cases and helping agencies all across the state. And most of that happens without anyone knowing that. Um, so there are ways to continue to build and, and do better work that helps the public. The consumer protection tool was the biggest one and also the civil rights division. Uh, and we've done some important work, but there's massive room for growth there. Um, and that civil rights work really calls to me. I was the chair of the civil rights subcommittee for all of the U.S. attorneys in the country when I was the United States attorney. Um, and every day in this state, there are people that are having their rights violated in housing, in their jobs, in their schools. They might be you know, relatively minor things for the vast public. But when you are someone who doesn't have access to a facility because you are in a wheelchair, uh, when you're someone that's going to interface with a public agency, but they're not providing the language services that they're obligated to provide under law, when you're someone like that, that has a huge impact on their life. And this is the, the reason that we have a separately elected AG, because we are the people's lawyer, and it's our job to bring that affirmative work. So I think mostly around the consumer protection and the civil rights lens, you know, there's tons of consumer protection cases that happen every day that don't make big headlines. But when we're seeing vulnerable communities like veterans, like elderly population be misled by corporations and, and losing their wages or losing their retirement savings, uh, the AG's office can be a stop guard from that happening and enforcement uh, mechanism against corporations and other entities that are violating their rights. So we need to be really aggressive in this space because it is the most important work, I think, at the end of the day is helping the public improve. The last thing I'll say is so much of the advice of the AG is helping agencies and we need to help them do better job serving the public. And most of that work never gets headlines. But, you know, there's hundreds of cases with the Department of Corrections right now where the DOC is violating people that are incarcerated, violating their rights, violating the rights of their family members. Uh, and that work needs to get better. And there's a myriad of agencies across the state where the AG can help their services be improved. And that helps the public then doesn't make headlines ever. Thank you. We'll now go to follow-ups and our board members will raise their hands when and if they have a question. And I will take liberty if I don't see any hands pop up. Alex. Uh, so Nick, you referenced earlier, uh, or you highlighted some of the novel approaches that Attorney General Ferguson took with this position, such as like starting the Environmental Enforcement Ag um, Department or the uh, Civil Rights Department. So what novel approaches would you take if you were elected to be the Attorney General? Yeah, the biggest thing that I've thought of thus far um, that's akin to some of those things is my plan is to create a new division in the agency specifically focused on labor and worker protections. Um, this is an area where Bob and his team have done tremendous work, and I don't think that there's been a better uh, labor attorney general in Washington state history. But as I looked around other attorney general's offices in the state or in the country, there's about 10 or so that have some version of a labor unit or worker protection unit, et cetera. Uh, and they've been delivering some really important results. Um, and I often think as a Democrat, this is an area where we need to continue to get better. We have been strong champions for laborers and workers, but oftentimes the approach and the priority doesn't seem cohesive uh, to me. And so one of the things I think that is a big benefit of creating this new division is centralizing all of that great work into one office 
and it sends a message to the public about some of the things that are going to be priorities for me as attorney general. Uh, and I think that's an important time because they're a really important moment, I think, in our country around labor issues specifically. And again, looking at some of these other agencies in other states to see them attack issues like wage theft and the underground economy and get massive recoveries from employers that are doing a lot of harm to their workforce and to taxpayers is something that I think is just a really uh, area for growth here. And I'd love to implement that as attorney general. Thank you. I'll see if I see another hand go up. If I do not see a hand go up, one of the, oh, I see Jeremy's hand. Jeremy. Yeah, I don't, I don't actually have a specific uh, question, but can you, can you just talk for a little bit about, um, about um, po just uh, police accountability and what, as AG, what you would, what type of work you would do in this area? Yeah, uh, and I'm glad you asked because it's, I think it's super important. Um, and this issue kind of ebbs and flows in people's awareness and, and, and uh, priority list. I've been a lawyer for 22 years the vast majority of that working around uh, police issues. Uh, it is really important for me to have that perspective, having started my career as a criminal defense lawyer. For two years in the army, I, I represented people who had been accused of crimes uh, and often serious crimes. Um, but I really recognized sort of the power of government and law enforcement in that concept, because oftentimes my clients were guilty of something but not exactly what they had been accused of. Uh, and oftentimes they had interfaced with law enforcement in a negative way. And really all throughout my career, I've, I've sort of been building on that experience at a very uh, serious level. Um, I think there are a lot of things we need to do. I love the idea of having an office of independent prosecution. And I think that office should exist in the attorney general's office. I was really happy to see the state adopt the uh, office of independent investigation. Uh, which is led by someone that I used to work with uh, as as an assistant U.S. attorney. But we need to do more and more to hold people accountable. Uh, you know, Bob and his team have been prosecuting these cases, uh, but they're very hard cases to prosecute. We need to do more that prevents people from having a violation in one agency and then simply moving on to another one. Uh, and we've sort of nibbled around the edges around ways to do that. Um, but we also need to find leaders who can talk to law enforcement uh, in a very proactive and productive way. And I'll tell you, one of the very first calls uh, that I got when I decided to run for attorney general last year was someone from WASPIC, who I had worked with when I was governor's counsel. Uh, and he said, hey, look, I'm glad you're running. Let me know if you need introductions or connections with sheriffs and chiefs. And what he said was, he said, I want to be clear. It's not because I often agreed with you. And in fact, we often disagreed. Uh, but I always found you to be a good, reliable and honest partner. And I had spent four years with the governor leading a lot of the efforts around police accountability and reform. Uh, I led a lot of the conversations around the body camera impl implementation uh, prior to initiative uh, five, 590. Um, we led, did a lot of really active work around use of force policy and use of force legislation. And I would have these really tough conversations and debates uh, with law enforcement because we were often at ends. Uh, but it was good for the people of Washington. I think ultimately it was good for them uh, and I was really proud that even though we often disagreed, I was able to, to lead that conversation forward. And so I think I bring a lot of credibility to this space um, to help improve some of the relationships. But this really matters because there are people whose rights are being violated in Washington by law enforcement all the time. And that's just a fact. Um, and we need to tell the truth about that and build whatever tools we can to bring more accountability around it. Thank you, Nick. I'm not seeing another hand, so I'm going to jump in the queue and ask you something that's weighing heavily on my mind as we are going to face a number of things that we don't know what they will be, but how do you reconcile moments where the rule of law and justice and what is right are not necessarily aligned? And, and I wonder if you have any more kind of philosophic reflections, philosophical reflections that you could share with us about kind of what are the values and, and perspectives that motivate you and how you would go into these moments of complexity. Really take it any way you want, but it's something <laughs> playing on my head. Thank you. It, well, it's really dangerous to give a lawyer an open-ended question like that uh, to let me pontificate. Um, you know, I mean, the first thing that honestly comes to mind is that these are just really hard issues. Um, and oftentimes I see leaders, politicians, aspiring politicians um, try to promise people silver bullets or magic button solutions for these issues. And they're just not. 
and I aspire to never become that person who tells you that there are easy ways to improve things. There are oftentimes clear solutions, uh, but most of the things that have been raised today, in particular, the last one around crime and, and police accountability and public safety, those are really hard, complex issues. What I think keeps me anchored uh, throughout my career is uh, a few things. To be very honest, uh, to be very transparent, uh, and to never pretend that I have all the answers. Um, I've been practicing for, you know, over a couple of decades now. I have a very broad and diverse legal experience that I think uniquely equips me for this job. But oftentimes the wisest voices in the rooms are the quietest ones, the people who don't get called on or ask for their opinion. And one of the things I've learned as a leader, as an executive, is to try to find ways to empower those people to help inform the decisions that ultimately the person in the big corner office has to make because those are tough decisions. Uh, and I hope as a leader, I can continue to be inclusive in that, in that area. Um, when you are honest and transparent and open, it helps you stay centered on your ethical obligations as a lawyer, your obligation to the public, because then they can hold you accountable if you're not doing what you say. Um, but the law is a really important tool. Um, you know, I, my, my father was a child of the civil rights movement. Um, my parents are a biracial couple who could not get married until a year. Uh, they got married a year after Loving v. Virginia was passed. It is a tool for justice when it is used well. Um, and I think if I just stay anchored to those values, then I'll be okay. I will make mistakes, but I'll be okay. Thank you so much for being with us. We will close the recording now and this will end the formal part of our interview.